I'm Dr. Craig Eskude, the host of IDD Health Matters, a podcast where we talk about health, wellness, and health equity for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome to this episode of IDD Health Matters. We have an amazing guest with us today, Dr. Rick Rader. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So we're coming to you from the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry, which Dr. Rick Rader had a, a small piece maybe in starting. <laughs> I drew the logo, basically. <laughs> Let, tell, tell us about the story. Well, the story basically probably should start with me because that's who I am and how did I get here. Yep. So I'm a physician, um, formally trained in internal medicine. And um, my only exposure to what is now known as children with special health care needs. I went to medical school in England, and I was fortunate enough to do my pediatric rotation at the Hospital for Sick Children, the Great Ormond Street Hospital, which was the prototype global hospital for children. And in my third year there, basically, I received a note, a message in my mailbox from my chief registrar, and it said, Rick, check out the FLK in Eleanor East. Eleanor East was the ward, and, and basically, th these were open bed wards. They were not, you know, private rooms, et cetera. And I went into the ward, and I'm walking around from bed to bed, and the nurse was on duty there. She said, um, can I help you? And I said, uh, yeah, Dr. Godfrey said to come up and check out the FLK. So she says, well, you look bewildered. I said, well, what's an FLK? She says, she says funny-looking kid. Warning, this might be a little difficult to hear, but this is actually the way people were referred to Correct. in the past. FLK was not a derogatory term. It was a clinical description of individuals that had unique and novel facial dysmorphologies. And basically, that was, that was my, my exposure to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so basically, I went to medical school and finished and, and did my residency and was actually working, um, I, I have a fellowship in psychoneuroimmunology, and my field of interest and expertise was in, in stress medicine. And I was executive director of the American Institute of Stress. Very satisfied, very, very happy. One day in 1993, for whatever reason, I still don't know, I was looking through JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, and the want ads, and I came across an ad that's really looking back, was very seductive, um, which led to where I am today. And interesting, I have a copy of that ad because I keep it in my office to make sure I'm doing what they thought I wanted to do. So, And I think it's a good introduction to the whole field. So, Are you still holding to that same ad description? Are you still, yes. still doing that? Yes. Is that it right there? And let me share it with you, okay? <laughs> oh, that's phenomenal. So... We'll, we'll, we'll have to get this up on the screen. Yeah, so basically this is the JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, dated December 1st, 1993. And it was basically professional and technical situations wanted. Seeking an extraordinary professional. Well, how could I not there respond you, to that? There you go, right yeah. there. Right. Seeking an extraordinary professional for a leading, private, nonprofit, non-institutional, non-governmental center. Our center serves mentally handicapped and medically fragile individuals and has been a pioneer for over four decades in methodology, programming, and facility to economically improve the lives of its clients. Today, a new generation of services is requisite to continue in the forefront of these endeavors. We seek an imaginative, aggressive, inventive individual who can, as required, develop and lead cooperative research, implementation, cross-discipline involvement, including perhaps not limited to staffs of our local universities, national pharmaceutical companies, medical professionals, computer companies, etc. Our new habilitation center, scheduled to be completed in December 1993, is built for the new generation of service. Currently, our facilities also include 26 residential with 15 additional funded and ready to be built, an educational facility, workshop, and vocational training facility, a major recycling center, work development and placement facility, and a full medical and dental and therapeutic service union. Please send letter of intent with resume to P.O. Box 2491, Chattanooga, Tennessee. And that was 30 years ago. Yeah, and I basically was intrigued because 
I was unfamiliar with some of the terms and phrases that we're using. For instance, when it referred to this thing called habilitation, I thought it was a misprint. I, like most people, basically are familiar with rehabilitation, rehabilitation which right. is the retraining of skills to people who had those skills and lost them, either through cognitive decay or basically trauma, et cetera, or aging. Um, our individuals, basically, we're not retraining them. We're training them for the first time. And the interesting thing is it's, it's the way we look at outcomes. The word itself is, is fascinating me. It comes from the Latin uh, habilis, meaning to make fit or to make suitable. And when you think about it, that's what we do as clinicians in this field. We try to make the individuals more suitable, and, uh, um, and we try to make the environment, especially health access, you know, a better fit. I had never heard of the expression medically fragile. Um, and basically, so out of, more out of curiosity, again, I was really very happy with my job. I was at the top of the field in, um, in stress medicine. But does that mean you caused a lot of stress? I certainly do. Or were you and trying I, to reduce stress? And I continue. Okay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and it was interesting, you know, and, and we could talk about that another time, but basically the people that I worked for were NASA, you know, basically, you know, providing stress, uh, stress medicine and counseling to the NASA astronauts. Um, wow. Disney, basically looking at their movie scripts to see whether or not there was any unconscious bias towards stress, et cetera. So I... I get a phone call from this place in Chattanooga, Tennessee called the Orange Grove Center, and they said, we received your resume with interest and fly down. Again, more out of curiosity than anything, I flew down there and basically saw this amazing place that had grown in 1953 by parents. The prevailing advice from physicians to parents, not just in Tennessee, but all across the country, was basically if you had a child with a developmental disability or a birth defect, send the kid to the institution, take care of the normal healthy ones. Well, a bunch of defiant parents said, no, we don't want to do that, basically. And they formed, uh, you know, they put an ad in the newspaper using terms like if you're the parent of a mentally handicapped, crippled, retarded kids, you know, come come visit us, et cetera. And a handful of parents started it. And um, I was lucky enough in to basically be earmarked to take them to the next level of medical care. Um, one of the things that um, not only my center started to notice, but everybody started to notice, was the increase in longevity. And basically that was a problem because we had never been thrown into the aging process with this population. Since then we've seen the incredible proclivity towards um, folks with Down syndrome having Alzheimer's disease. So I'm, I'm going to stop you there. So you said you, you were faced with kind of the new problem. Why, did, why were people living longer now? Well, not only was medical care better across the board, but basically they started to give the individuals what they needed. And a lot of that was social affiliation. And social affiliation and basically socialization is neuroprotective as well as cardiac protective. Meaning that when you socialize more, you actually can have better mental health, better physical health as well. Exactly. And all of those things are all connected. Social connection increases your self-esteem, your self-confidence, and basically your willingness to go out and explore things. And it's typically through exploration. Um, and also, there was a change in, a little bit of a change in perception. At, at that time, and still now, there's not a lot of adult physicians in this particular field. Right. The pediatric world basically had it pretty well covered with, um, w with the postgraduates going through fellowships in developmental and behavioral pediatrics. Mm -hmm. And God love those guys because they were following this population well into their 20s. And pediatrics, as you know, is an age-specific right. profession. But there was nobody basically to look after them. And although they did a heroic job, I thought it was pretty inappropriate for a 43-year-old woman with Down syndrome to be getting her gynecological care from a pediatrician. Right. And so we started, to, um, we started to challenge the medical profession. And um, we started to have little outgrowths, slowly but surely. And also, you know, one thing I found that was very interesting is that our individuals, individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, there's a stigma against them. And that's been ever since the village idiots in you know, medieval times. So. You know, they were different, they were unique, they were considered defective, and they were considered burdens of society or menaces. 
Interestingly enough, I found out that the physicians and the nurses and the caregivers who align themselves with this population were also stigmatized. You know, if you announce yourself that, you know, I'm a doctor in an institution or basically I have a small clinic and I take care of folks with Down syndrome, they would want to know why couldn't you make it with real patients, et cetera. I, I experienced that myself. Yeah. yeah. And that was probably, you know, another reason. The other problem is there was no exposure in medical school to this population. You know, you could become a board certified, even today, a board certified family practice doc without ever having the experience and the challenge of examining an individual with Down syndrome or Fragile X syndrome, et cetera. Um, and now that the population is getting larger, the beauty of what we now call developmental medicine is that the skills that you can learn to take care of this population are transferable to the general population, especially as they, the neurotypicals, as they age, because they're prone to the same indignation, the same biological indignation, you know, confusion, mobility problems, you know, difficulty communicating. Exactly, right. Um, Verbally. Isolation, you know, loneliness, et cetera, depression. So uh, there's something for everybody in this particular field. So right about 2002, uh, Surgeon General of the United States, David Satcher, put out a call for um, a national task force and a meeting in Washington. It was called um, Closing the Gap, um, addressing the, um, the problems of people with mental retardation. Mental right. retardation, again, was one of the litany of terms and, 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 and templates for this population. The interesting thing about that is I think that these terms have a shelf life of about 20 years. They're descriptive terms that were used to describe individuals from one physician to another. And basically, after 20 years or so, popular culture basically kidnaps them and basically hijacks them and applies them. So over the years, since the early 1900s, we've seen terms like idiot, um, migrants, um, you, you know, you name it, um, et, et cetera. And, you know, the latest one in, in the 1970s was mental retardation. And so that was the name of, of, the, uh, of, of Dr. Satch's thing. And um, the usual suspects all combined to go to Washington and to learn about that. One of the things that was brought out was and I didn't know it, the number one unmet healthcare need for this population, certainly at that time and probably now, was oral healthcare. And so there was a smattering of physicians there and doctors, et cetera, and some policymakers. On the third day, the last day, Dr. Satcher said to the audience something that really resonated with us. He says, I want to thank everybody for their contributions. This was really, really a significant eye-opening seminar task force. He said, but if you don't give this conference legs, it'll just remain in the bottom drawer at the U.S. printing office. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of us who really didn't know each other got together in Washington, some physicians and some dentists, and we said, what are we going to do about this? And I'm sure Dr. Perlman probably described you know, in detail how it came about, but up until that time, there was no organization. Um, the earliest organization that we know of was ha had the ominous name of the American Association of Superintendents of Asylums for the Insane, you know, wow. et, et cetera, which eventually became the American Association of Mental Retardation, which then became the American Association of Intellectual, you know, and um, which we know of yeah, AAIDD, AAIDD right. right. Interestingly enough, another term that had changed, and I, I found it's very interesting, and I was lucky enough to be appointed as a member of it, PCMR, which was the President's Committee for Mental Retardation, which was actually started, and the impetus was started by JFK, um, as you know, has a mm -hmm. sister with, with uh, an intellectual disability. And PCMR, you know, basically got together, it was mostly the social model because the medical model was late in being recognized as being a valuable contribution to their care and custody. Um, and when I was there, this young girl came to the President's Committee, PCMR, and basically said, I don't like being called retarded. And we said, well, we're the President's Committee, we could do something about that. Literally overnight, we changed the name from President's Committee for Mental Retardation to the President's Committee for People with Intellectual Disabilities, PCPID. 
and we released the white doves and applauded each other and said, well, this is great. Well, be careful what you wish for. We were not well experienced in governmental parlance, and basically the term intellectual disability was not part of any federal statutes. So what had happened was parents would bring their children to a social worker and say, I want to enroll my child. She's eligible for special education and special care. And the clerk you know, on the computer screen would say, well, what's, what's your daughter's disability? The woman said, my daughter has an intellectual disability. And they would go down the line and said, and it wasn't on the list. It wasn't on, sorry, next, et cetera. Wow. So there was actually, President Obama signed into law Rose's law, named after the little girl that basically said, I don't like it when you call me retarded. And that basically removed the terminology of mental retardation from federal statutes. So yeah, there wasn't um, that long ago. I remember when all that happened. Yeah. yeah. So, wow. Incredible stories and amazing history uh, yeah. that you have. You, you touched on something that I, I, I'm going to ask you to, ex to expand upon a little bit. You talked about the medical model and the social model. Could you touch on those a bit? Yeah, and luckily that's pretty much been put to rest. There's been an amalgam between the two of them, which is always the best thing for, uh, you know, uh, conventions. Um, the social model basically uh, has approached folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities not as patients, not as a disease, not as a defect, but as individuals that belong to a segment of society that was a little different, et cetera. And the medical model you know, basically looked at them as people with defects, people with diseases, people that we, by virtue of the fact that we were attracted to anti-medicine, wanted to fix. And basically there was an, a, there was an interaction that, that was not really, really hand in glove. My understanding is that the medical model uh, has evolved or, or we've moved away from using that term. And I still hear it referred to as a, as a very negative thing when people say, oh, that's the medical model when you talk about health care. Correct. But maybe not. Well, I don't mean to be defensive, but I like to defend my profession. And it was the physicians back in the medieval times, if you were a parent of a child, of a deformed child, you didn't bring them to the poets. You didn't bring them to the treasurers. You didn't bring them to the swordsmen or the musicians or the legal profession. You brought them to physicians. And physicians did what physicians still do. We cared for them. We studied them. We labeled them. And we tried to figure out what to do with them. And, you know, yeah, perhaps... I, I, looking back, there was a lot of the social model that was basically devoid and not really adopted. But those times have changed now, and basically we now look to what's called the biopsychosocial model, which says any one model for this population or any population is inappropriate without the best ingredients from the other populations and also from the other, the other models. So I'm proud to say that the AADMD almost from its onset, has been strong proponents of the biopsychosocial model. So you've been a part of the AADMD since the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, any exciting, interesting stories that, that you can share about the organization? You know, as I said, we, you... we started from a very, very small group that we became friends and colleagues from Satch's meeting. And... There were probably only, there was less than a dozen of us, uh, and we all had full-time jobs. Anybody in this particular field wears many, many hats, including the hats of an advocate. Um, and so we, we were passionate, and we were also found that we had a camaraderie, and we needed each other not only to learn what the best practices were, but also the best practices of survival and justification for why we came into being. Um, and a couple of things that, that we did that we were very, very proud of, um, you know, there was a young girl named Amelia, and uh, Amelia had Wolf um, Hutchinson's disease, um, and she needed a kidney transplant. And she was taken to CHOP, Children's Hospital of uh, Philadelphia, which is probably one of the world's most impressive, distinguished, and respected pediatric transplant centers in the country. And she needed a transplant for her kidneys. And her mom took her in to meet the staff. And if you could imagine sitting in a room, in a conference room, Mrs. Rivera with her 12-year-old daughter sitting on her lap, looking across the table to the transplant surgeon, 
the head of medical ethics, um, the head of legal department, case management, head of nursing, and basically the transplant surgeon looked into the eyes of the mother and said, we don't waste organs on kids like that. Mm. Well, you could only imagine, you know, what that did. Um, somehow we got, we got wind of it, the AADMD, and we created a campaign that brought CHOP to their knees and basically offered, um, offered an explanation which was not very well received, but basically offered an apology. The twist to the story is that the Riveras were not looking for an organ. Mrs. Rivera had a histocompatible kidney that she wanted to give to her daughter. They were only looking for the mechanical Someone work, et cetera, and they still did that. That basically led, and even though it, it's not necessary for legislation because under the, you know, um, under the ADA, the Americans with um, Disabilities Act, you cannot deny somebody any services based solely on their, their disability. Um, but there were several states that basically enacted laws and basically all the advocates jumped on it um, and basically making sure that individuals with disabilities not only could be organ recipients, but they could be organ donors as well. Interestingly enough, Back in the early 90s, I had a mother of a child with Down syndrome call me and said, <clears throat> Dr. Rada, my daughter is basically terminal, and I was wondering whether or not she could be an organ donor. And nobody had ever even brought that up. And I said, I don't know, but I'll find out. And I actually called up the University of Pittsburgh, the Stossel Transplant Center, and I asked them, I said, could it? And they said, we don't know. And interestingly enough, they said, why do you want to know? And I said, why do you want to know why I want to know? And I said, because we have a mother whose child wants to be. And basically, we went through the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act. And basically, the, an intellectual disability is not necessarily a contraindication for someone being. And when I presented that to parents every year for our yearly medical just to, br just to bring the subject up, you know, they are so delighted to hear that because we're asking them or offering them that possibility is not payback for the community having taken care of their child. It's basically a declaration of the value of that particular child, and this is basically the penultimate way to say they are not part of the community, they are the community. And since then, we've had over probably a dozen parents that basically have um, indicated their interest at that point in time that their child would be an organ donor. So, Well, that, that's a, a phenomenal success story of the advocacy part of, mm -hmm. of what AAD&D yeah. does. An, an, another thing that was significant is that a bunch of us got together to... Um, we, we basically testified in front of CODA. CODA is the Council on Dental Accreditation. Mm -hmm. And at their meeting, we basically explained to them, and they're responsible for medical and for dental school curriculums and standards. We were able to convince them of the necessity to ensure that every graduate of a United States dental school is trained in providing treatment and management for folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Now, it probably took over 10 years for that germ of a great idea to actually become, you know, integrated into legal doctrine. But, but you uh, did it, but, and that's another phenomenal But we did it, phenomenal and it was another accomplishment. Yeah. accomplishment. So yeah. it basically is, I think the AADMD is a demonstration of what can happen when a small group of dedicated, committed people who don't take no for an answer, you know, can rise to the occasion, you know. So, Rick, one of, the, one of the things I like to do is ask guests to give three pieces of advice, three words of wisdom, anything that you'd like to share with the audience in three minutes that um, people out there can do or, or, or take part in in their lives that can improve health equity for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So, Well, I think one go. of the first things that is important is for people who are not familiar, who have no affiliation with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, 
to do something about that. And there are a lot of avenues of doing that. One way is basically you could become involved with Special Olympics or the Best Buddies yep. or basically go to a school that has special ed programs and basically maybe volunteer. It's important to know exactly who it is that we are advocating for. Another consideration that I would say it's really, really very important and it's underreported and undervalued and that's the contribution of direct support professionals, which we now call DSPs. This is the frontline folks that work in group homes. They work in vocational settings, et cetera. They are underpaid, they're underappreciated, and um, they are the ones that have contributed to the longevity of our individuals. Um, unfortunately, because they're undervalued and underpaid, we have an incredible shortage of DSPs. There's a turnover rate of about 45%. The problem with the turnover rate is the ones that have been there working with these individuals for long periods of time get to know them. They can basically ascertain the subtle changes, and that's what we want as physicians. You know, we're not waiting for sepsis to announce itself or dehydration, et cetera. We want to know, you know, from a DSP who can say to us, you know, Dr. Rader, you know, he used to love chocolate pudding, and all of a sudden he stopped. Right. Or basically, he doesn't like showers; he prefers baths. That's different as well. Or and or, those or little things. indicators can be a sign of of something something brewing. Exactly. Yep. Also appreciating the fact that um, a lot of our individuals don't don't vocalize; they don't best communicate in the traditional ways. The way that they always communicate to us is through behavior. And so basically when you see a behavior that is aberrant or strange or unorthodox, you know, it's not attention-seeking behavior. It's basically they're calling out for they're unhappy or they're in a disfamiliar situation, et cetera. We say um, that a lot. It's behavior is communication. Exactly. And, and a person is communicating something. Right. The other thing, probably the last thing, is Western society values people for what they do. You're an architect, you're a doctor, you're a politician, you're a banker, et cetera. We don't value people for what they are. And the value, the intrinsic value of individuals with disabilities, especially my field, intellectual and developmental disabilities, they have value by presenting to us the full spectrum of humanity. And that alone is basically talks more for their worth than value than for somebody who has built a bridge or basically built an apartment building or basically even gone to the moon, perhaps. I love that, Rick. And, and that's, you know, over the years that, that we've gotten to know each other, that's one of my favorite things to, to hear from you are the stories that you have and the way that you tell the stories with 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 uh, just such such compassion and, and a little bit of humor and, 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 and a vast understanding of, of this field. I really thank you for sharing some of your stories today. I hope we get to do this again another yeah. time. And congratulations to you for basically taking the time to, uh, to incorporate the stories, stories and the narratives of not only the individuals that we care for and care about, but the narratives of how these clinicians came to this field um, is, is really amazing. Well, thank you again for being here and for the work that you, you, you have done and the work that I know you'll continue to do. And I, and I will leave us with this. I think the moral of the story is, is be really careful what ad you answer to because it may become what you do for the rest of your life. Absolutely. It's seductive. <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay. Okay.